This week on Motor Week, Ginny Buckley goes for a spin in Subaru's new legacy. We find out if Toyota's Land Cruiser can match the Range Rover with Ian Royal, and I go green laning. When Subaru first launched the Legacy last year, it was quickly followed by a new addition, the Legacy Outback. Both of these estates offered great performance, peace of mind, and little luxury touches that made them a good buy when compared to others in the class. Now the Legacy was bold and it was brash, yet it appealed to drivers because of its practical utility nature. It could do the rounds of the farmer's fields and still had a little extra kick to keep the drivers happy. What it didn't appeal to was the lucrative executive market. So to bridge that gap, Subaru have launched this, the Legacy Saloon. The go-anywhere, anytime capabilities of this car have been very well disguised. At first glance, you wouldn't think that it could go through boggy waters or drifting snow, but thanks to the all-wheel drive capabilities, it can. In terms of styling, Subaru have tried for the slick, executive look. Well, that's what they were aiming for anyway. What spoils the look of this car for me is the front. It's obviously taken from its estate brothers, but it fails to complement the modern, meaner look at the back of the car. Still, a redeeming factor is the side skirts and the alloy wheels, which come as standards on all models. Once inside, you'll find that some effort has been made to steer away from those famously bland Japanese interiors. Without much success, I'm afraid. However, you do get some nice luxury touches. The leather seats come as standard on the saloon, along with electric windows and climate control. And if it's little extras you're after, then you can opt for the Electric's Luxury Package, which comes complete with cruise control and my favourite electric seats. But luxury or not, there just isn't the kind of build quality in here that you expect in the executive car park. The seats, surprisingly, are manually operated. The buttons and the switches all feel a little bit flimsy. And the steering wheel. Well, it just doesn't suit the car. It's huge. It would seem more in place in a bus. So will this affect the handling of the Legacy? Well, there's only one way to find out. This is the automatic version with the 2.5 litre engine producing 160 brake horsepower. What's very disappointing is that you really can't feel that power, there's just simply no kick there. Apparently it takes just over 10 seconds to get from 0 to 60, but it actually feels like an eternity before the engine starts to respond. And that lack of responsiveness gets very frustrating when you're driving around town. There's certainly no burning rubber in the traffic lights in this one. But when you get the revs up into the mid-range, the Legacy picks up quite nicely. It has a top speed of just under 130 miles per hour and it's brilliant for cruising up and down the motorway in. Now let's get back to the steering. Although responsive, I think it feels far too light and there really isn't the instant power in the automatic version to get you out of a tricky situation should you spin that wheel a bit too much. What about the all-wheel drive system? Well, it should mean that this vehicle corners as if it's on rails. Now, it does have an all-wheel drive badge on the back, but that really isn't reflected in the handling. In general, the whole ride is far too soft and it just isn't entertaining enough. The redeeming factor of this car is that it's actually not that bad value for money. You get all the trimmings, a decent engine and not a bad looking car for a reasonable price of around £18,000. If you're not bothered about that luxury pack and you do want to use this car as a utility vehicle, then you could save yourself nearly three grand, as that's how much those extras cost. All in all, the Legacy Saloon isn't a bad car. This two and a half litre engine should prove to be far more entertaining with a manual gearbox, and I'm sure that it is. What Subaru are trying to do with the Legacy is to break its mould. They want it to leave the country lanes behind and head for the road to town. But it isn't quite there yet and it would take rather a posh farmer who would use this car to chase his sheep in. When the beasts of the jungle come together, head to head, stand back. 
because there can be only one winner. It's the Toyota Land Cruiser Amazon versus the Range Rover. And they really don't come any bigger than these two. From Japan, we have the young upstart, the Toyota Land Cruiser Amazon, and the English country gentleman, the Range Rover. Both, as you can see, are huge vehicles. They have enormous V8 engines. They'll pull almost anything you throw at it, and you certainly wouldn't want to get into an argument with either of these two vehicles. Now, the Range Rover has been around for a long, long time. Its previous model saw some 25 years service before this one was introduced in 1994. It's beginning to look, well, a bit dated now, but it's comfortable, it's luxurious, and amongst the well-heeled and the country set, the Range Rover is the best thing on four wheels. Toyota, as well as Land Rover, are renowned for producing superb, almost bulletproof 4x4 vehicles. The Amazon is truly massive, and it's not often you can say that a car dwarfs a Range Rover, but the Land Cruiser does. This latest generation was introduced in 1998, including some revisions to the engines. It's over 16 feet long and nearly 6.5 feet wide, and would probably give you serious problems parking this in the supermarket car park week in, week out. Now, both cars benefit from adjustable height control, which means you can vary it to set it higher or lower depending on what sort of terrain you're going, for instance, over rocky roads or wading through water. The Toyota's is not as complex, though, as the Range Rover's, which benefits from air suspension and gives an unparalleled ride all the way around. The Land Cruiser is the top of the range 4.6 VX V8, produces 232 brake horsepower. You can also have manual options and diesel ones as well with a 4. 2 litre engine. Similar sort of thing with the Range Rover, 2.5 BMW diesels, a 4 litre V8, or this 4.6 HSE V8 producing 225 brake horsepower. Now, interior space is interesting in these because that's where the Land Cruiser definitely wins. As you can see in here, it is positively enormous, but unfortunately, in terms of style, rather disappointing. If you want a car that offers more interior space than this, then I suggest you buy a double-decker bus. It seats seven people with fold-away rear seats, enough space for your luggage as well. But one thing the Japanese have never been able to match the Brits for is the quality of their interiors, and this car is no exception. Lots of grey plastic everywhere, and the grey leather combination doesn't exactly help. It also has more buttons and gadgets than even I know what to do with. This car really is too big for everyday driving. Toyota see the Amazon as a rival to quality luxury cars like the S-Class and the 7 Series. It's also interesting to note that Toyota have decided not to badge the Amazon as a Lexus in this country, as they do in many countries abroad. I'm afraid in the driving stakes, the Amazon is not much fun at all to drive. The steering is very lifeless, it's very wishy-washy, there's no feedback to the driver. Sure, it has a very responsive 4.7-litre V8 engine linked to a very smooth automatic gearbox, but it's off-road where cars like this really come into its own. It's just such a big car to place on tight country lanes that you wouldn't want to do too much of that sort of driving, and there's an awful lot of body roll as well. Under the bonnet, of course, is that big V8 engine, which means that this is a thirsty beast. Expect around town to get around 12 miles to the gallon. On the motorway, you might, you might, if you have a light right foot, get close to 20, but don't expect much more. If you wanted a car to drive across the outback of Australia, for instance, which would you choose? Well, the Amazon would certainly be the number one choice. It is ultra, ultra reliable, and unfortunately, the Range Rover is not. If you're driving hundreds and hundreds of miles, you don't want a car that's going to break down on you. And believe me, this won't. It's also a car that in busy city traffic you can edge out from a tight side road and other cars just seem to shrink out of the way. It's really rather fun.
It's funny how two direct rivals in the 4x4 market can be so different. Interior-wise, for me, you just can't beat the Range Rover. It has a great combination of leather, wood and quality plastics. It eludes the air of a gentleman's club with these superb front armchairs. It's not as big as the Land Cruiser, admittedly. But if you specify the autobiography one, you can have just about anything you want. Satellite navigation, different leather and wood, televisions and videos in the back, picnic tables. If you've got the money, it's yours. I have to say I'm a big fan of the Range Rover. Sure, it looks a bit outdated these days. It is, after all, due for a change in the next year or so. But it's still, for me, one of the kings of the off-road market. It certainly has reliability problems. There are horrific reports of cars like this, which cost £50,000 new, quite simply bursting into flames. Bits drop off them. Hopefully, the reliability problem will, at some stage, be solved. But don't bet your life on it. It's a great car to drive off-road and on-road as well. It certainly drives and handles better than the Amazon. But of course, cars like this aren't meant to be pushed hard down fast country lanes like sports cars. You just can't expect it to drive like that. But it's a very relaxed, very comfortable, very luxurious cruiser. The most worrying aspect of the Range Rover is fuel consumption. This 4.6 litre V8 engine positively drinks fuel like there's no tomorrow. Around town you might get about 250 miles to the tank on a long high speed run, maybe about 350, maybe a touch more. But remember, you've put over 60 pounds worth of fuel in there in the first place. Quite frightening really. The Land Cruiser is such a robust car, it's great off-road, it's a car that will never let you down. It's just a shame about that poor interior and the sheer size of it. It's not cheap either, £44,000 for that model. Also not cheap is the Range Rover, £50,000 for that HSE. It's a car that if image is important to you, well it's certainly a car to be seen in. It'll be interesting to see how Land Rover changed the vehicle at the start of the next century. So for me, just about. It's the Range Rover I'll be driving home in tonight. Chrysler as a manufacturer is 75 years old this year. And 75 years ago, they were building these. It's a Chrysler 70, and it was being built of all places in queue. So it's a kind of a Q car. It was also called the Chrysler 6, and that's on account of its six-cylinder engine, a straight six under there. Also, it was, at its time, a lightweight, pretty quick thing. We're talking 60 miles an hour. <laughs> This in its day was not only high tech, but a pretty racy little number. And it still works beautifully today. <laughs> Whoa! Hey! In part two, I leave the roads and take to the tracks to go green laning. So, you've bought yourself a 4x4. It's big and shiny and beautiful, there's room for the kids in it, there's room for the shopping, there's room to go on holiday, and you're very happy with it, and all progresses well. Until gradually, bit by bit, you start to pick away at the corners of the idea of thinking, well, just what can this thing do off-road? What is it like? What is it capable of that ordinary cars aren't? Well, I know how we can help you there. Because there's a group of people here who probably went through a similar process. You're all members of Glass, Green Lane Association, and did it start as idle curiosity one day thinking, well, I wonder what this car can actually do? Yes, it did for the vast majority of the members of the club. The club itself started off with a small group in Wales who, with tremendous scenery right on their doorsteps, wanted to get out and have a look and see what was there. You can see a nice amount of the country by walking, a lot more by riding a horse, but the only way to get out and enjoy the bulk of the country is in a vehicle. Now, people are going to say that the two aren't necessarily compatible. Big cars like the ones we've got around us and the countryside. But we are talking green laning, which is very different to your traditional off-roading. That's right. We only actually drive on public rights away that have full vehicular rights. There are off-road sites for people that want to play with the vehicles. What we do is not playing. It is very, very careful, considerate driving in the countryside. The only thing we want to leave behind us is a very, very minor 
trace on the grass if we can help it. And all we want to take away with this is our memories. In terms of techniques, what am I going to need to know? Because we are going to take a car around this. What am I going to have to bear in mind? Low speed. Just keep the engine ticking over and with the vehicle you've got there, it'll virtually do it for you. That's the beauty of the types of products we use on these routes. Steering, you need to make sure that minor pieces like your thumbs are kept outside the steering wheel. But again, knowing that you're fairly new to this, we'll make sure that someone's there and you'll be briefed all the way. It's going to be just as well. We've got a lovely Land Rover Discovery that Land Rover very kindly loaned us for the day. We're not going to damage it, we absolutely promise. Okay. Please. Uh, what is the, the popular car here? We've got all the Defenders you'd expect to see in the old Land Rovers, Range Rovers. What is the one? Personally, I... Still a fan of the old series Land Rovers, although I don't own one anymore. They are still my favourite. But as you'll see from the vehicles we've got here today, there's American vehicles here, Japanese vehicles here, and a very, very good showing from Solihull. Right. Uh, it's, all, it's all down to personal preference. What if you turn up in one of the little tiddly off-roaders to an event like this? Is everybody going to laugh you off? No, not at all. We've got a number of very small Suzukis here today. Um, they all have their place. They're all capable little vehicles. And to be honest, in many ways, you could say that uh, they are the optimum vehicle because they're lighter. Right, well, let's give it a go. And can I actually say, I was going to say, let's off-road. But of course we're not. We're green laning. Or off tarmacking. Let's off tarmac. Either way. So, Paul, you have the misfortune to be my passenger this afternoon. Uh, oh. How did you get into green laning then? Why green laning? Well, I've done a lot of uh, off-road uh, or off tarmac driving around the world. Um, I found I enjoyed it a lot, um, driving you know, Land Rovers in various places. So when I got back, I got uh, involved with uh, Glass, the Green Lane Association, because I just felt it's something I'd like to do, and it's good fun getting out in the country with your vehicle. Now, when you're on one of your photo assignments, it's slightly different, because you're romping through a battle zone or whatever you're doing, and you go wherever you want. But obviously, we're in one of the counties in our own fair country now, and you can't really do that. How do we know where to go? Well. Uh, yeah, largely when you're when you're in a, in a battle area, you tend to go on the marked strips anyway because it could be a landmine <laughs> yes. anywhere off. But I know what you mean. Um, first thing you do is get your ordnance survey map, and they they have byways and rups. It's a road used as public paths uh, marked. Then just to confirm they are actually vehicular and they you, you can use them, you go to the county hall, uh, your local authority. Uh, local highway authority and you find the definitive map and the list of streets. Once you've made sure they're actually on there and shown as vehicular, away you go. Because we've really got to do the uh, must stress you can't just drive anywhere a bit because you, you've got to be careful haven't you? I mean you, you could really annoy people if you, if you did this in the wrong place. That's right, I mean it, there are a lot of, there's a lot of land that's private, there's a lot of um, bridleways which although they will look very inviting simply aren't vehicular and you, you, you mustn't drive on them. So it is a question of finding the right place. Now there is quite a, I wouldn't say complex, but quite a comprehensive set of etiquettes to things that you do and don't do, aren't there? I mean, if you encounter passes by, for instance. Yeah, if you uh, come across a walker or especially horse riders, uh, we tend to stop, let them walk past, unless they're making it very obvious that they are waiting for you. Um, in fact, with horses, um, it's generally a good idea to switch the engine off, let them go past, and then go away. It only holds you up a minute, and that's, let's face it, nobody comes out here to run. So you work as a, a photographer for newspapers, and obviously all around the world, and as you said, frequently in battle zones. It's kind of a different sort of driving, I would imagine. Is that your more extreme, your proper like off-roading off-road? Well, it can be. I mean, you'll find that roads tend to lose their surfaces very quickly when the tanks are rolling up and down them. Now there are occasions when you come upon blockages or it is a bit sort of blocked over. What do you actually do? Well, if you've got a, an illegal obstruction on a byway, on something you can definitely, it definitely has vehicular rights, the law allows you to abate the blockage, you can remove it, which in extreme circumstances means uh, soaring the lock off a, of a padlocked gate or uh, removing uh, large obstructions. You know, sometimes you have to sort of tow tr fallen trees that people have deliberately laid across uh, byways. Um, landowners d do it illegally because they don't want you to help you use what is your legal right of way. On a simpler basis, you sometimes have to tackle the odd overgrowing branch, don't you, that might just take your paint off? Well, we, yes, we do. And, you know, sometimes, of course, through disuse, the lanes become overgrown. 
in which case we have sort of regular lane maintenance days uh, where we do um, you know, green lane restoration. I suppose, interestingly enough, when you're rolling along these places, there's quite a lot of social history because some of these lanes are ancient. Well, yeah, I mean, look at the road we're on now. This is uh, Ermin Street. This is a Roman road. This used to be the main Roman road leading to Lincoln. Uh, effectively, it was the A1 of its day. Um, so, I mean, this, that's sort of, you know, 2,000 years old, this road. And it's as simple as that. Taking your 4x4 a bit beyond the school run doesn't have to be dangerous for either you or your car. Not a scratch on it. In fact, I didn't even get it dirty, which is a disappointment. I wanted to look all macho. Back next time. Ford has recalled 240,000 Focus across Europe in order to rectify an electrical problem. All the cars involved were produced between last September, when production began, through until March this year. Water leaking into the car's regulators could result in an inappropriate charge being sent by the alternator to the battery, leading to stop-start problems. 61,000 models sold in the UK will be affected. Ford will be contacting owners to inform them that dealers will replace the regulators for free. British mark Land Rover came second only to Lexus in a US survey of car buyers. The Strategic Vision Dealer Total Quality Index is a survey of 34,000 customers and relates to all aspects of the buying process. According to the AA, price increases plus a 1% rise in insurance premium tax are taking their toll on motorist pockets. The cost of an average comprehensive car policy has gone up by £44.91 to £464 since July. Next week on Motor Week, I get a first drive in the gorgeous Audi TT. Ginny Buckley gets a drive in the very important Rover 75, and Ian Royal drives the Peugeot 306 Rally.